All right, well, we're live. It is um, Wednesday, June 19th, and it's uh, summer seems to be accelerating. Uh, apparently, the weather patterns are shifting. Uh, Rhode Island and Toronto are very hot, and Texas is not so hot. Uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation today. We have a great guest. But before we get rolling here, let's have our own John Sibley Butler recently inducted into the Austin Tech Hall of Fame. Play some music. Thank you. Hey, tomorrow, where are you going? Do you have some room for me? Since the night is falling, the dawn is calling, and I'll have a new day. If it have me, well, I've been wasted and I've overtasted all the things that life gave to me, and I've been trusted, abused, and busted, and I've been taken by those close to me. Hey, tomorrow. You gotta believe that I'm through wasting what's left of me. Cause the night is falling and a new dawn is falling, and I'll have a new dawn if it will have me. All right, Johnny. Thank, Thank you. you. A little Jim Croce there. From always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Johnny, uh, you know, uh, we seem to be uh, taking a pause here for the summer. Uh, technology is going wild. Um, uh, you know, the the EEI, the Edison Electric Institute, is having its conference right now. And Jensen Wan, the CEO of NVIDIA, was the keynote speaker. And the power sector is... Uh, fairly aware of what's going on with uh, AI and data centers and the amount of uh, need for more gigawatts to be added to the grid. And Elon Musk uh, had his uh, annual conference last week and he was uh, asked about uh, the Cybertruck, uh, which will start shipping sometime in Q1 of next year. He was also asked about his uh, line of robots called the Optimus Robots from mm -hmm. Tesla, where he predicted that everybody would have one robot in their house. Uh, he also predicted that the market cap of Tesla would be $5 trillion within 10 years. Uh, lots of exciting things going on. Your CNBC disrupted 50s coming up. Um, what say you? Well, I've been working hard on the CNBC Disruptive Technologies. That's always a great fifth to put out. But I've been I've been speaking. I've, I've been to half the speeches, and we'll always ask about the grid. And uh, I use my distinguished colleagues, Lou Ellen King's um, great essays sometimes to uh, to reference as I talk about uh, AI now, because what he has done is put it in a historical perspective. And if you look at, for example, if you look at electric cars, we know that the first electric cars was at the end of the, 18, I guess, the 1890s. And then if you look at what's happened with all of the technology, this is what's so interesting. It was all sort of in one space. I had a conversation yesterday with a major, major insurance company. You know, I was a State Farm uh, insurance company's major consultant for 22 years about all of the technologies and, and uh, how it might change the business models. And if you look at Elon Musk, what he's really talking about is our business models. What I find interesting, who's now in Austin now, is that there, there's a focus, but there's also a, a lack of focus. That is, when I say lack of focus, focus, then we know that things can change very, very rapidly. But like the television, like the automobile, and like the airplane, you know, if you look at the, at the um, production of the airplane, Ford Motor Company was course, did some of the first airplanes. So there's a lot going on. And the big question is, how are people utilizing those things? So one of the things you have to do is look, for example, 
at how the AI would change the business models, how it would change how they make money, how they do well in the future. So I always would say, I know there's going to be a great, great insurance company in the future, but it must be, in this case, State Farm, because I think it's a great insurance company. And I think Elon's vision is absolutely wonderful. I think he brings to America that immigrant vision about what can be. He's not stuck in the mud of what has been. So I really like that. He talks about the transformation as we did in the 1890s and 1920s of building new towns, looking at people moving moving around and looking at people providing new opportunities. The big thing that's, that's, that's really interesting to me is how people are kind of stuck in the mud about going back to work. My own University of Texas at Austin had to issue <laughs> a mandate that people will come back to the office, period. So I think that's a trend we need to pay attention to because it has great ramifications for office space. It has ramifications for restaurants and other kinds of services industry that's around the office space. It has great, great implications for transportation, where transportation would go. And then on top of that, of course, we've got the two conflicts in the world. We've got what's going on in Ukraine and and uh, and, and and Russia. We've got what's going on in, in the Middle East with, with Israel. And so you got a lot of stuff that's going on. And then, of course, on top of that, we got the most interesting election since I've been alive. But if we keep our mind on the technology, that's one thing. But as Llewellyn always reminds us, it is what I call the social physics and how people react to things that would take us to the next level where we need to be. So we need to pay attention to the consumer and we need to bring the consumer along. And I'll, I'll end with this. Everybody won, everybody knows that a great case study is what did what did what did Ford's consumers want? They wanted a faster horse when he built the Model T. So everything is is pretty wild, but in America we like for things to be wild and we'll take care of it. Excellent, excellent. Llewellyn, sir, how are you? You're right, it's a very convulsive time. So much technology is coming to market. I've been reading on it now. I went down to a conference of small private companies, big tech companies, organized as a trans um, corporate uh, event by NASA and my colleague at NASA, who has been really in the front line of AI and before that of uh, of uh, uh, just innovation. He was NASA's top innovation officer. And now he's the top AI person. His name is, he's got a new book out, and which is called This Time It's Different. And his name is Omar Hattemley, but he's fairly self-effacing. He's not a publicity seeker, but he is an extraordinary thinker. And he, in a way, set the tone. Uh, what did we learn from the techies? They thought they were pushing too hard for commercial reasons and were bringing product to market, i.e. Uh, different uh, ways of using AI. They were not ready, so we're getting mistakes, which crop up as uh, hallucinations. Um, that was an important thing. The other is that almost absolutely the big tech companies believe or the staff of the big tech companies believe that this is the beginning of an entirely new chapter in the human experience, that this is as big or bigger than the Industrial Revolution, artificial intelligence is, and that it is going to upend almost every aspect of national life. I also have been up <clears throat> looking at what MIT is at, and particularly Fusion. There's a company in Massachusetts which is affiliated with MIT, which believes it will have a fusion reactor on the market in the early 2030s. This is astounding stuff. We have gotten so used to the idea that fusion was always 30 years away. It may not be. It may have arrived. Think of what it will mean. It will mean that nobody will want fission, Nobody will want those small modular reactors that are the passion of the moment, because with fusion, you don't have waste products. You don't have a nuclear waste problem. This could be a very upending technology if, if the company, which is called 
Commonwealth fusion systems uh, can pull it off. But it's very to closely aligned with MIT and with their work on fusion, which goes back many, many decades. I've been following it for quite a few decades myself, and that's huge. Also, in energy storage, there are giant leaps going forward. Uh, batteries and uh, not always things that really class as batteries. So, there, anyway, I'm so moved by what is happening and how it is going to impact the electric supply that I organized with the United States Energy Association, one of the monthly briefings I do for the media uh, on these new technologies, new connectors, new reactors, fusion, but the fusion industry doesn't like the word reactor. They like device or something else. Uh, uh, new storage, new power electronics, a whole new dawn uh, could be within a decade in the electric business. And that will change the current predictions, which are we going to run out of electricity somewhere starting next winter, according to the NERV and continuing unabated shortages until 2050, after which nobody seems to make any predictions whatsoever. Um, so it's very exciting. We have a race on to create more electricity, and suddenly we have new technologies that may help towards that goal. Nothing is guaranteed. Everything is in flux, high excitement, a great time for technology, but a scary time for people because one of the consequences of artificial intelligence will be, at least initially, and maybe for the first hundred years, it will subtract jobs. Uh, it is not analogous. I've said this on this program previously. It is not analogous to automation, which added jobs because it made things and made more jobs and more needs. This actually subtracts it is a huge addition to efficiency, and efficiency is not a job creator. So interesting that um, uh, a lot of what's going on really um, is driving in many ways, and we have been talking about something called Industry 4.0 for a long time, uh, and AI is sort of um, being, uh, you know, not only leapfrogging uh, into the minds of many, even though it's been around for 25 years or so, uh, uh, as a, you know, up and coming uh, take over well, everything. It's actually been around around for 70 some years. That's okay. a concept. Well, um, as a, as a has... concept, sure. Uh, but I'm, it, talking it, about, it... I'm talking about people working on it and, and actually delivering products <laughs> around it. So um, my point is that, um, you know, all this to say that the U.S. is in a big uh, push with the Cheap Chips Act and birthing or rebirthing manufacturing back in the United States. And we're trying to really figure out what that formula looks like. I personally believe that the renaissance of manufacturing in the U.S. is all going to be automated, robots everywhere, sort of like how chips are made. And it's going to be interesting how that sort of um, evolves over time. Texas is um, open for business, and as it is, I'm sure, the rest of the U.S., but Texas in particular has seen an incredible uh, growth of companies moving here and wanting to open facilities. So it's interesting that we have a guest here who's an expert in manufacturing, uh, and we're delighted to have Joanne Friedman, CEO in principle of the smart manufacturing practice at Connected Minds Inc. as our digital roundtable guest speaker for the next hour or so. And Connected Minds helps global manufacturing organizations navigate the complexities of Industry 4.0 and intricacies of the industrial internet of things to deliver more value across trading ecosystems faster and at a lower cost. Welcome, Joanne Friedman. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure uh, to be here. T t tell us a bit about you and your background and tell us about Connected uh, Minds and, and what's uh, what are you working on these days? Sure. Uh, my background, engineering, manufacturing, uh, four different industries under my belt. 
uh, got scooped up out of IBM into industry, out of industry, uh, pharmaceutical, life science, then electronics and high tech. You couldn't get farther apart if you tried, but it falls into process and discrete. Uh, my attraction to pharmaceutical was basically because I'm the canary in the coal mine. I'm terribly drug allergic. And I figured if you throw me in a drug factory and something goes wrong, well, you'll know you don't have, you have an air quality problem. But irrespective of that, um, what fascinates me about this whole uh, generation of technology and to the point that was made earlier about job creation and job loss, I think AI is also going to spawn new industries. And so will robotics. Um, I think part of the issue that the US and other countries have is there's still this perception that factories are dirty, factories are, you know, lower, more blue collar than white collar, that they're not sophisticated, that they don't challenge you. And I would put a lot of emphasis on they are also a great equalizer to gender issues. Uh, because I know a lot of women control engineers and other forms of engineers who've done very, very well in manufacturing. Um, but overall, the job loss that's being created by AI, I look at non-value at task. And I put it in a value equation because that's where AI shines. It takes out the noise. It takes out those low value tasks that people really don't want to do that hinder us from doing more knowledge oriented tasks. And I think that that's where, you know, when some people say it's coming after the uh, white collar mid market or mid level manager roles, that's not really true. It's taking the mundane and the low value tasks away, but it's giving us more time to create knowledge. And what I think has to happen and tying that back into manufacturing is you have a lot of people leaving uh, manufacturing and not a lot of people coming in, uh, not only because the perception of, is it's an old dirty factory, but also because people don't quite understand what manufacturing does these days. It's not like you see widgets coming off the line the way you might have seen cars coming off the line 25 years ago. Now it's very tech oriented. It's very clean. Um, but the perception not being the reality where AI kind of comes in and says, well, we can take the, the mundane tasks away. We can also start to create the knowledge of corporate knowledge or institutional knowledge that's not being captured as people retire. That's the um, subject matter expertise that factories definitely need and that needs to be brought forward. And hopefully that model can be used as a way to foster the growth of uh, more cottage industries. For example, in robotics, where, you know, is that going to be our next um, car mechanic? Is our robotics mechanic? Why not? People will design them, but somebody has to maintain them. Somebody has to improve upon them. As we're looking at automation, we need to also look at automation meets AI. And the buzz may be generative AI, but there's a lot of AI in manufacturing already. It's physics-based. People don't talk about that because they don't quite get it. But there's a tremendous amount of value to be added by using the AI in that, in that scheme. So as much as there's negative implications for AI taking jobs, I see positive signs that it will create and spin off new industries. They may be small at first, but for sustainability, for uh, the grid, for a, a variety of different industries that will emerge out of this current inflection point. After all, manufacturers don't make products anymore. They make experiences. Yeah, yeah well, I thought I found interesting. If we, if we move away from the term AI and go to machine learning, which I think is the, sure. the term that, that scholars like to use, and if we think about uh, what has happened over the years, and, and we think about how engineering has has changed how things move. So in a real in a real kind of sense, if you look at automation, you go back to the the traditional case study of the of the development of the Model T. When in in a real sense, it 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 also that was pre AI, that was pre machine learning, but certainly it was it was the machine learning in the mechanical, if you will, tradition. 
So I like to see, I always like to say, say to where to see where we are now, we like to go back in the day a hundred years. So if you go back and look at the development of of uh, machinery in industry, people also talked about losing jobs. And Luella mm -hmm. said that this is very, very different. If you go back and look at um, the automobile, pe people talked about losing jobs. So I think the way you discussed this is machine learning. And and the questions I have for you is, is how, uh, 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 Joanne, how do you see, I'm just going to use AI or machine learning. First of all, if I were to put you, this is my favorite question. If I were to put you in the, the C-suite of any industry, where sure. are they in terms of knowledge and know-how about the evolving machine learning kinds of things? If you put me in any, what's if, evolving in the sense of? Yeah, in the C-suite, do the CEOs know what's going going on in their industry with AI? In the uh, they have industry. inklings. They have inklings. I mean, they they. You know, it's funny because I participate in a lot of industry groups in elect in electronics manufacturing. Um, I I sit on the board of Mesa, uh, which is where manufacturing and IT come together. Um, and I also lead one of the sessions on smart manufacturing. What they know is the buzz terms. What they want is the translation to how is this going to impact my bottom line and my top line? And for that, the answer to your question, if I can teach a machine how to be both more efficient and profitable via something like OEE metrics, operational excellence or operational equipment excellence, um, then I've created a bridge between their top line and their bottom line. They don't really understand exactly what it's doing for them unless you tie something like robotics to that machine learning and say, well, I'm saving you cost of labor or I'm filling the gap where you can't find labor to do that job anymore. So they do understand to an extent the, uh, the technology of using automation through machine learning or machine learning to AI they don't necessarily make the correlation to the fact that it can be leveraged in a flywheel effect to create value across the industry. So for example, even more to the point, the answer to your question on machine learning is, I look at industry four, smart manufacturing and industry five, the buzz. And I say, this is three separate issues. Industry four was really focused on automation and data exchange. Smart manufacturing is focused on process and enhancing the process with machine learning or AI uh, for efficiency, for quality, for responsiveness. And when I look at I, industry five, my favorite these days, it's about human centric design. And if I look and compare the three and put that in the C-suite and say to um, you know, the CEO of a major manufacturer, literally, quite literally, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he'll look at me like, how dare you? But my answer, the, the question is really germane because it's what kind of a business do you want to be two years from now or a year from now? What outcomes do you want to achieve? How are you going to use the technology to enable the outcome that you want to get to? And they'll say to me, well, I want to be industry four or I want to be industry five. What they don't realize in terms of machine learning and AI in particular in Industry 4 is Industry 4 is actually a very smart strategy, a very savvy strategy around saving time, period, full stop. It's about time to data, time to decision, and time to value. And if you take those three pillars and apply them to machine learning, the more I can educate the machine to do the job, the more I can leverage the model to make the job that the machine learning has now mastered and say, you have expertise at a, at a degree or a level that can now be implemented to change multiple processes to save overall time to value. So the C-suite gets that message, mm -hmm. but they don't get the uh, bits and bytes of the technology and they're really moving away from the technology-driven enterprise of a couple of years ago, more towards the purposeful enabling technologies to get the business value that they need. They've seen the error of their ways because 
87% of digital transformation fails. It never gets out of proof of concept. That's a very high percentage of failure. So they're investing millions of dollars and they're not getting the ROI or the earned value or the value at all. So it's about teaching them. And this is what I do on the daily is teaching them how to create a flywheel effect of value from the technology, from the ML. If I take the uh, inculcated knowledge of an organization and use that as my training set for machine learning, think about the AI that I could create. It's not generative, it might be regressive linear analytics, it might be physics oriented, but my processes will be more time, timely, less time consuming, and give me overall value faster. If I can produce a thousand widgets more a shift than I'm currently producing now, any CEO will love me. Yeah. And that's, that's really good. what it's about. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this real fast. You know, I um, would there be a revolt of the consumer? For example, I would pay a huge fee to have an American Express platinum, so I never have to express talk to a machine, <laughs> right? So when I travel, I call American Express platinum because I got tired of putting on hold, tired of the phone hanging up, uh, tired of talking to machines. So yep. my wife says, "Why do you have this American Express platinum?" And I said, "Because I'm tired of talking to machines." So my question to you is, do you think, can you see in your equation in terms of the human focus where the there will be another enterprise? I wouldn't say that it would leave, but there'll be another enterprise that says, here you go, you speak to a human, you speak to a human all of the time. And that in turn would produce a whole nother sector, but it would be very, very expensive. That's the way it the world be. Yeah, people yes. get tired of flying public aircraft, they go to private planes. People get tired of this, they create another model. So my question is, have you seen in your data, because I mm -hmm. see the CEOs in the C-suite are sometimes, they're kind of afraid to change because they don't want to lose the consumer. Because right. now everybody can get access on the internet. And what's, what's, what's the value proposition? Is it price? Everybody's got the technology now. So how do you see the humans in this revolting or remaining the same? No, I, I think, I don't know that I would necessarily say revolt. I would say rebel against a bad chatbot or a hallucinating gen, a, gen AI. Yes. I mean, when I answer the phone, one of the first questions I ask people, if I don't know who's calling me is, are you human? And <laughs> Some people get very offended by it and other people laugh. And I say, I'm not trying to be rude to you. I just want to know, am I speaking to a machine or am I speaking to a human being? Because I find the more artic articulate or eloquent you are as a speaker, the less the chatbots understand you. And yeah. I think that's one of the biggest reasons that people want to go back to speaking to a human being because most chatbots are designed for I don't want to say something very negative, but a fourth grader, maybe they have no comprehension of more than two syllable words. So I have had my own frustration with a human not being there when I've typed in the word human to speak to someone and it doesn't understand me. The, the business model, by the way, for that is experience. Just as I said, manufacturers don't make products anymore. They mm -hmm. sell experiences. Think Caterpillar, think, you know, any of the major manufacturers that have integrated ancillary and adjacent services into their product offering. So the, re the rebellion that you're speaking of uh, mm -hmm. will be, I would rather pay the price to get a straight answer than jump through the hoops, hoops of, a of a chat bot. So yes, I can see those of a luxury brand, for example, who take the chatbots for the lower level kind of questions, but immediately transfer you to a human when they realize that what you're asking is not the fourth grade level. Gotcha. And people do pay a premium for it. <laughs> yes. If they didn't, your, your American Express wouldn't be useful to you. That's right. I mean, I I mean, it's like having a private dinner club rather than a restaurant. It's the same thing to me from a business model. 
Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Joanne, I find what you have to say very interesting, but I'm alarmed by your idea that basically everyone can get a better job and is somehow going to be able to execute that job. Fact is, in my experience employing people, there are there is an intellectual underclass. Find wonderful people who can only do very simple work. You'll find them in fast food. You used to find them in big newspapers where the printers would take in a certain number of people. They weren't allowed to work on page one, etc. But it gave them dignified employment. Uh, what we are seeing, and it's already begun, it's not something that might happen. We're already seeing, for example, I just read, I think today or yesterday, about a vast reduction in the number of gig workers writing programming. Well, that's the high end comparatively. At the low end, we know that the fast food restaurants are reducing their staffing because they're using AI. Those people are not going to be re-educated. They're not going to move up to a more rewarding undertaking because it's not within their competence. Um, when I had a small print shop in Washington to publish my newsletters, uh, of five people, four of them, if you changed any system, it was huge stress. And they showed their stress and I felt for them. Uh, so that the idea that everybody can sort of move up and suddenly nobody wants to do menial work, some people have no choice but to do menial work because that's how nature equipped them. And those people are very, very, very vulnerable. And I don't think, I, I was just on a television program interviewing somebody else about AI and got exactly the same idea that there's going to be a great sort of moving up of the human experience, but it isn't going to happen because some people were not equipped by their maker with the, with the noose to move up. Otherwise, we're going to see marvelous things come in manufacturing. I don't think, mm -hmm. uh, uh, going back to what, what Johnny said about Elon Musk and everybody's going to have their own, I uh, don't think everybody's going to have their own, not in, in several hundred years probably, their own uh, robot in the house because some people still can't afford their own washing machine in the house. How they're going to go out and afford a robot, uh, especially when they have no work, it's rather hard to conceive. We have a very high chance that there will be, for quite a long period of time, a surplus of unemployed people who are unemployed because they've been displaced by technology, but who do not have the intellectual capacity to find new work that is different, that is challenging, and that's hard. And those are the people I, I actually like and I care about, and I've seen them all over the world and they're not going to move up. They're not going to go out and get more education and suddenly uh, be doing something more challenging than what they have been doing heretofore. I would, I would challenge the assumption only in one respect. I didn't say that they would move up. I said that they would move out horizontally into other industries and create roles for themselves. I'm already seeing it in interlogistics. People who were shippers, who were unloading and unpacking trucks, who now have been, that role has been replaced by a palletizer or a pick pack robot, whatever the, the case of automation it is. And now they're advising their employer about the role that they had, what they need in that automated environment. So it's not an up necessarily. It's a broader spectrum of how do you take that workforce and create value add to your point to those who may not have been well educated or are just ill-equipped to have that education and retrain them in a different way. And the retraining is not necessarily education-based. It could be OTJ on the job. You were doing this before, you understand the logistics side of a business or the warehousing side, tell us how we can improve that. And where I'm seeing inroads being made to that class of people, and a class is the wrong word, I'm sorry, uh, but to that group of people 
is they're moving into areas where they can add more value, like the size of the packaging is wrong. Or I always struggled with this issue when I was packing a truck. Now we can look at, you know, let me show you how it should be done based on my 20, 30, 50 years of experience. So if we can capture that knowledge that they have, even at a very limited level, we can leverage that and try and move them into other situations. I, like you, am very concerned about that group of people. I'm trying to find ways to um, leverage their capabilities and give them a different role in a slightly different way that doesn't require a PhD, that doesn't require a bachelor's degree, that may be an on-the-job, one-year training scenario. And I think I the think, people in... Go ahead. I think in the interim, while we go through a huge uh, change, the safest place for people to be is in mechanical artisanal work because they yes. have some skill that is repetitive. And I think it'll be a long time before you have robots. I had a man on my television show yesterday suggesting that robots would be installing house wiring, not in a long, long time, because it would be a very poor economic use of a very expensive machine, the robot, to do a very menial thing. But uh, unfortunately, the man I was interviewing was into the world of higher education, and you can educate people into everything. I think there are underclasses. I know the word class is totally appropriate. I wouldn't apologize for it. I think the, as an intellectual underclass, it's the class I came from. I know about them, and I care for them. As do I. Listen, my son was a provincial scholar in math and chose to go into trades. And I'm happy to tell you that despite my objections to it, he's doing extremely well and, and was employed long before those of his peers that went to university for four or five years. And do, so there is, a, there is one university I mentioned in here, or college in Charleston, South Carolina. I've done television programs on it and written about where you get a four year arts degree and a degree in, in, in a trade, stone cutting. Uh, uh, right. masonry, something like that, um, uh, blacksmithing, uh, metalwork, etc. And mostly those people start their own businesses because they have a saleable skill, but they're smart enough to go to what is actually a four-year college. There are an awful lot of people who shouldn't go anywhere near a college because they just don't have this structure to absorb it. They're not bad, they're not evil, they're no, no. Just, that's how they are. And I think those people get glossed over very quickly by the educational machine, which uh, has an imperial dimension to it. I, I would hope that we can, especially in the US, and I was speaking about this on another broadcast, can look at apprenticeships the way they used to be viewed uh, and, and even the way they're viewed in Germany now and say, you know what, it may take three years or it may take five years, but you're not, you're going to be able to be employable. You don't have to have the um, big credential that some other people might need just to qualify for a job. You have the skills, you have the capabilities. I'm hopeful that apprenticeships will start resurging, especially in the US where they have fallen by the wayside for so long and allow people to capitalize on what you're talking about in South Carolina. I know that I've had the discussion with you know, folks at Georgia Tech and Rensselaer and some of the other major universities that are actually asking the questions, what do we do with this workforce? And, you know, my, uh, you know, from my son's perspective, he's a master electrician and has two other tickets, but I've said to him repeatedly, you work in the commercial space, not in the residential space. Why aren't you looking at building automation and robotics and things of that ilk? And his answer is, I am. I'm just not quite there yet because the market hasn't caught up. That doesn't mean that that's not going to be a whole other set of trades and industries. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying that the jobs may be taken away, but those are the kinds of things that will replace them, at least to a certain degree. Now, let me let me join this conversation. It sounds like when Please. I was in high school, we had shop 
We had home economics. We had it all. And of course, uh, uh, Tuskegee Institute had a business school and the trades also. So they were way ahead of themselves. But I always thought this. I really think, as I've said before, that AI sometimes reduces the skills necessary to work. It does. Luella knows. It makes us lazy. <laughs> yeah, Luella knows that pilots do not fly planes now. We, I call, I call pilots now, uh, you know, or uh, passengers. Uh, we know that it doesn't take as much to drive a car now. Even now on the highway, it would talk to you. We also know my favorite one is that when I was coming up, we would get behind Mrs. McGee because she knew how to operate the adding machine at a grocery store. Now it's just beep, beep, beep. So my question to you is that as the skills needed, this is what I think. I think if when Lou Ellen flew an airplane, it was a skill needed. Right now he can get in, punch, and it would take him to wherever he wants to go and he would just babysit it. So my question to you is this, and, and, and this is the way I'm thinking about it. I always looked at college education. I like to say I am a fourth generation college uh, educated person. It was about networking. It was about being smart and networking. And then, Joanna, Joanne, the industry train you. There was no notion that you would leave, you know, uh, Brown with any knowledge to work on Wall Street, but they trained you. <laughs> There was no, no knowledge that when you left Yale, you were going to be a an accountant. They train you. So I think we've got to get back to the point where industry will hire smart people. And mm -hmm. the only reason to hire someone from university, I think, is they've been introduced. They know how to get up. They know how to network. They've got good friends in high places, right? Doesn't make you smart. But do you think we'll get back to the point where industry would take and, and uh, an interest in training people like it was prior to the 1970s and not depend yeah. upon universities to just hire mm -hmm. and have them ready to come out? Um, yes, I think that they will out of necessity. Otherwise, you're going to see manufacturing shrink to be lights out factories everywhere. And the mm -hmm. lights out factory is basically, this is what China did about two and a half, three years ago. Um, you'd have 800 people working in a factory and they would reduce it down to 25. Why? Mm -hmm. Because all of the automation and all of the robotics made it a lights out factory. They only needed supervisory and control engineers, maybe a couple of people in management, but basically the rest was all 100% automated. If you think about um, the last election and pre that election, there was a uh, a big announcement about a factory in Wisconsin, I think it was in your country that had the potential to put 13,000 jobs in that factory. It never materialized. Why? Because the deal uh, did not take into account that the parent company actually had already gone lights out in 90% of its facilities and there were no workers in those factories. So why would they start creating jobs for workers in manufacturing when their heritage of three years or five years was to remove all of that labor and that labor cost? Um, I think they have no choice, but I also think that there's this perception, as I said earlier, that factories are dirty places, that they're not for, you know, um, you don't wanna go and work in one. Now, some may be that way, but the ones that I've been in of late, it's pristine environment. You could walk around with white gloves and never find a speck of dust. And it's a lot of computing. It's a lot of um, it's a lot of electronics, a lot of computing, and a lot of uh, robotics and cobotics that are in there as well. So there, this perception has to change. But industry will accept people. Well, good. Well, let me come back to my major question. Yes. Uh, right, China did something that nobody has done in in, in five thousand years. First of all, it took them one generation to raise an entire population into the let's call it just, just call it into the um, into the middle class, okay. Mm -hmm. And they also combined a form of market economy capitalism with a form of socialism, not yes. not communism but socialism. And mm -hmm. I think that that is that was a remarkable feat. 
So when we look at the fact that we make nothing in America, we don't make bow ties, we don't make shoes, where do we go as we talk about these fabulous jobs being lost? They're already in China. Where do we go from here in terms of how you work with industry and bringing industry back, not necessarily to America, back to maybe back to uh, Mexico and this part of the uh, Western Hemisphere? Mm -hmm. um, I think some of it is already starting to happen. The culprit is not the offshoring, though. The culprit is the outsourcing. I mean, think about Boeing. As, as a primary example, they outsource quality control. Look what happened. And I'm not poking the bear or intending okay. to poke the okay. bear. They, poke. <laughs> <laughs> they do. But, you know, it wasn't, and I read this uh, the other day, quality failed Boeing, Boeing did not fail quality. I take umbrage at that because it's, it's, a, it's a paradigm. Quality should be part of your work ethic. It should be how you produce your goods and thinking about the human beings that are involved in a bad product quality versus a good product quality. But to your point of China, how they did that was the copy exactly mentality, right? I mean, when I worked in electronics, for example, there was a tremendous amount of uh, outsourcing to China for cost savings. Well, if you find an outsourced provider and you find somebody who's going to manufacture your good to your spec, what makes you think that they're not going to knock you off at a lower price point and compete against you? It's a self-inflicted wound. So to me, it's not about the offshoring part. It's about the outsourcing part. If you kept that intellectual capital and property in-house and did not allow your your what could be your primary competitor to be able to knock you off and use cheaper materials and cheaper labor, then you could resurge that manufacturing. I think where U.S. manufacturing is going to go is not into, uh, I mean, yes, there are issues with powertrains and EVs, but I think that the notion of regenerative business is one that the U.S. is ripe for. And that is to give back to not only the economy and society, but also um, in terms of recycle and, and sustainability to give back, start becoming regenerative businesses, which takes green and the notion of sustainability to an extreme called resiliency. We can now become more resilient because we are regenerative. We're regenerating our processes. We're regenerating our people. We're regenerating our goods if you will, through re recycle and reuse. Um, now, one could say solar panels might be the perfect opportunity to do that. There are folks that would say to me, yes, but they're all made in China. Well, no, they're not, not actually. Some are, for sure. But if you start recycling materials in a way that they can create new products, just like the beverage industry has done with bottles, you can start regenerating processes. You can start regenerating skills, jobs, parts of industries. And as don't outsource them again. All right, but, but Joanne, can, can, you can I just ask a quick question, Joanne? Oh, yeah, I'm um, sorry. Please. I think is very much in your belly way. And that is, I find myself at various times uh, hearing about disputes between IT and OT in companies. Oh, yes. Particularly when it comes to cybersecurity. And uh, yes. uh, um, when we bring in uh, machine learning and, and its uh, uh, progeny, which is uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, where does that go? What is its route into a manufacturing operation? Is it through the IT, which tends to have become an overlord, or is it through the OT, which thinks it really runs things? Both. It has to be both. The religious holy word, for lack of a better phrase, of chalk and cheese being IT and OT is really determined by what are you protecting? And the protecting is the shop floor, the intellectual capital of the shop floor. Look, manufacturing was the number one industry that was hit by cyber attack for the past three years. So there's gaps. And the gaps are 
you know, skunk works in factories. I need to get the data out of that machine. I'm just going to plug a wire in. You know, in IT, that we call that shadow IT. In OT, they're getting the job done. They need the data. They need to use it, so forth. So cybersecurity is an overall issue. It should be a CEO level issue, not just a CIO or CTO. Um, and you need to enforce the policy as much with AI as you do with cybersecurity of ethical use and risk versus cost. So it's an OT thing and it's an IT thing. I think more manufacturers are starting to recognize that they have to really protect the intellectual capital and property of the shop floor, whether it's a machine configuration or the data or process that spews out the widget at the end of it. And IT has the um, uh, stewardship, if you will, of protecting the enterprise regardless of its size. So it's a collaborative effort between both. Um, OT is not conversant with IT tools. IT is not always conversant with OT tools. And the war is not over um, them or us as much as I don't understand you and you don't speak my language either. So let's devise a third level language that we can both talk to. And that's where the convergence will happen. But there's a business driver. And in this case, it's brand. It's uh, the cost of a security breach to your customers, to your supply chain, et cetera. That's a great way to bring people together. So so I have a question. Uh, I haven't had a chance to jump in. I have a question about what you see, Joanne, uh, uh, on, on the following. Uh, if you look at manufacturing as it relates to the automotive industry and say Tesla, vertically integrated, everything built in-house from their own pressing machines to everything else. Uh, they make their own seats. They make everything. They don't want anybody to know how they do it. And then you got this other world where everything is being outsourced to contract manufacturers, uh, you mm -hmm. know, really from the, from the consumer electronics world. But that is, seems to be a trend that is progressing dramatically. So when you think about you know, the automation of processes, everything being connected with software systems, AI, and so on. Uh, what 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 do you see eventually winning? I mean, is it the scale of a China in a totalitarian system uh, being able to be, you know, systematically, vertically integrated, controlling labor and everything, the winning formula? Or is a democratizing, anybody can be a manufacturer globally with an open standards driven uh you know fabless uh manufacturer less uh capability and my design is better than you design and i'm in africa and i can be the next you know rockefeller thing what, what do you see is going to happen here um i see convergence i see a lot of consolidation coming in the industry automotive in particular you know you have tesla and then you have Fisker that went under, right? Filed chapter 11 uh, earlier today, I believe. So yeah. there's, there's so many inflection points all going on at the same time. But what I do see is the ecosystem of democratized data. So yes, you can be sitting as, a, as an ODM in any part of the world and I4, for example, industry four or even smart manufacturing would allow you to be 100% transparent, uh, get all your supply chain around the world and then assemble. What I see is what used to be called the merge in transit assembly model. So a company does not have to necessarily be vertically integrated because there are risks with that. Right. I mean, it's great to be able to have integrated systems and, you know, you're all in one column, uh, so to speak. But that doesn't necessarily mean you'll have the best of everything. There, there are things about Teslas that don't work. There are things about the business model of Tesla that doesn't work. So I see it more democratized. Um, I look at things from an ecosystem perspective. The root of time in manufacturing, as I said earlier, is one of the pillars. But even below that, I look at um, things like 
how you can take the um, the transparency levels of industry four and really start sharing information in a collaborative way. Cyber physical doesn't mean only equipment. Cyber physical can be machine and human at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that's our next thing that's coming down. That's the outgrowth in industry five, which is very human centric. And I'm, I'm very happy about it because for too long, I think IT or OT have been in a situation where human out of the loop. So the answer to your question about horizontal versus vertical, I see it very horizontal and I think we're better off for it. The outsourcing of intellectual capital in process, that I don't think will continue for too, too much longer. Yes, I understand everybody has a specialty, but if you were to draw a diagram of the electronics industry, it's the most convoluted um, uh, sort of industry you can imagine. You have co-operators. It's, it's almost like incestuous, for lack of a better word, sure. because people buy and sell from each other. And automotive is becoming the same way. As a matter of fact, the 11 industries that electronics feeds are all becoming the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Joanne, let me ask you this. You know, in the old days, let me go back when I was in, as I saw this thing evolve, we said that anything digital would be free. And mm -hmm. then we said that we have something called open innovation, which of course you, you, you call the democratization of the supply chain. And mm -hmm. if you look at the cases, you can say, well, what happened to Microsoft? Why did they go so fast? Whereas Apple or Macintosh had a problem. Well, anybody could write programs for an open invitation for Microsoft, but Apple or Macintosh restricted it. And what, yes. went, wrong, what went wrong is they went out of business and Microsoft saved them. So I like the idea about when something is vertically in integrated. And right now, if you have an Apple, an iPhone, then you are locked into a, <laughs> an well, iPhone. Yeah, so my question to you is that, is it is it true that anything is digital will probably be free or open innovation? And I think the protection came uh, when individuals' credit cards got into the cloud and we had mm -hmm. to protect but we have always said from the music industry <laughs> to the operating industry to that anything digital, and you know the musicians suffered, we're absolutely yes. free. What do you think about that? <laughs> I don't think it will be free for a long time, but I think it'll be rapidly commoditizing. Just like I believe, and, and you can call this my prediction for uh, the answer to both of your questions, if you will. Um, Generative AI, as much as it's being hyped, will commoditize very, very quickly, regardless of what the oh, models yeah. are. She who invents the small language model that's industry specific will rule the world because that's where it's actually going to get used. And mm -hmm. by the way, remember I said she. Oh, I because, like it. I mean, that's my favorite. I know. <laughs> but, but, that's my favorite. you know, because you, <laughs> you you have these <laughs> touche. Um, you have the large language models that everybody will use. You can write prompts for them. You can have Devin write your code for you, and you can go back and check it with another model, and so forth and so on. But when the rubber hits the road, it's the expertise of the human in designing the small language model that actually solves the business problem, takes into consideration the privacy of that data or intellectual capital and property, and can effectively be translated into the physicality of making something, whether it's more knowledge or a physical product and an experience. That's where the money is going to be, and that's where the future is. So the consolidation of horizontally democratizing data and manufacturing speaks very well to this notion of small language model. I could be an ODM in electronics, and suddenly I'm now the builder of small language models for design manufacture or hey, Joanne, for a fab. Yeah, see, Joanne, what happens with that, with that model is that when 
if I have a software company with that model and I'm purchased by a bigger company, they rewrite the code to fit their software. You know that, right? So what we got to do, they rewrite the code to fit whether it's IBM or, 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 mm -hmm. or whatever you. So I can go with a small software company and they purchase it. I give them the code and they rewrite it. So I like the idea of in the specific code, but that's also going back to what I call how industry uh, essentially started. That is, before there was cloud, there was a dumb computer. You might not be yeah. able, old enough to remember the dumb computer, right? And uh, the ACT 500, where we just hooked up to not the cloud, but just into the mainframe, right? And I then know. <laughs> all of us, Southern, all of this uniqueness, Microsoft, because you have to do well economically, you have to go to the standard, see? I mean, what you know, if you, if you talk to uh, Michael Dale, right, he would say, well, I was so successful because I would never sell a computer outside of the standard. You never went to right. the standard. So I think it's very, very interesting. Yes. Well, here's here's another thing that I, I think you might agree with. In, in the notion of verticalization versus not sharing or not outsourcing, let's say, and keeping everything in house, what I'm waiting to see, which went away 21 years ago with B2B, mm -hmm. and I was young and foolish, um, B2B, and <laughs> thank you, um, <laughs> B2B took away differentiable value. Absolutely. Absolutely, it did. I it's think we have the everything. chance, I think we have the chance to bring differentiable value back to the corporate world. That'll because be each of those processes that you're talking about, you know, they'll just knock it off and rewrite the code. Yep. No, what's in there is the nuance and the je ne sais quoi of a, of a corporate identity, of its brand, of its values, of the way it looks at the world. That is differentiable value. And that's what will propel the next set of. Oh, say bon. Say bon. Say vous parlez de français aussi? Bien sûr, je demeure au Canada. So, my mom, my grandma, and she was from Canada. She's from Nova Scotia. Well, no, your... So, I have a, so I have a very, final very question, Joanne. Joanne, yes. uh, could you tell me your thoughts on the following use case? I okay. want to buy my next supercar. It happens to be a Lamborghini. And in order to deliver that Lamborghini to me, I'm actually just buying the drawings of the Lamborghini, which will be printed inside my <laughs> own garage by my own 3D printer. Lovely. How far away are we from that? Not very far. Because we have 3D printers that can print metals. We have 3D printers that can print very new resins. And we have the power banks from the charger stations that we can put in. So your Lamborghini could be electric and it could be printed in your garage because each of the piece parts that go into that Lamborghini could be done with additive manufacturing, which is another dimension up from you know, smart manufacturing or I-5 or I-4, completely different dimensionality and use photovoltaic perhaps mm -hmm. paint on your yellow Lamborghini or red Lamborghini or coral. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say we're probably within four or five years only for one reason. It depends on the size of your garage. Right. How big, but, how big the printers could sure. be. Sure. And how but much grid should, you have available. It should be a Lexus LC 500 rather than that. Lamborghini. I don't know what you're talking about. But I think it's good. You know, what's, what's fascinating to me is the up and down of how technology takes us forward and takes us back. And I find really fascinating about the idea that we can go back to customization because uh, customization was one of the things that made a lot of small companies really do well. That is, yes. they would customize the experience from, you know, putting everything from customizing your car customizing your clothes, customizing the experience. And remember when, um, um, and, and, and I really liked the idea, you know, it was us who put uh, quality in Japan when, uh, what was his name, Llewellyn went to Japan for quality? 
Denman. Who was that? Was it Denman? Den yeah, Drucker. Drucker. No, Denman. Oh, yeah, yeah. I knew Rock. I met him. Yeah, Drucker. It was Denman, though. Yeah, went to and, and put in the quality in Japan. And basically, Rocker. that's what they did. That's how they beat. You know what I mean? And by the way, it Absolutely. was. It was open innovation. It was open open innovation in Japan. I was a professor at at, at Japan for fourteen summers, and I found it uh, very very interesting. So it's been it's been very very good. I'll have to we have to we'll have to talk. I'll send you an email. I'd love that. Sure. Well, oh. I think it's you know I mean I love the Lamborghini question. Um, I would I would actually like there's a project ongoing here. And uh, it's partially because of uh, for veterans, but I would love to see it for younger folk like my my child who's desperately wants to buy his own property, but it's just very expensive here. Um, I'm watching robots build tiny houses, but they're not so tiny that you couldn't live in them. They're like a thousand square feet. And it's completely done with additive manufacturing. So the concrete is coming out of a 3D printer and the whole nine yards of everything in there has been done either via robot or via 3D printing. And these are very sustainable dwellings because they're using geothermal or radiant heat or you know some sort of non-invasive kind of energy. And I'm hopeful that the size of your garage one day will be big enough that I can start printing tiny houses in there for the younger generation that needs to go into manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I'd like to just say there. this Good about enough. printing an automobile in the garage. It would be a terrible waste of the printing mechanism to have it to build one car for one person. Very uneconomic. Better to have a, a collective printer down the street and build cars sequentially for many people. The same thing which applies to the robot that's going to make beds at home. It will be too expensive. You will be able to print your car, but you will not be able to afford the printer unless you can spread the cost over many users. Well, Lou Ellen, they said the same thing about the telephone when we had when we go. In, no, they, they didn't. They no, said they the didn't. same thing about the washing machine. They no, said the they did not. About the automobile. They did not. I'm older than you. I remember what they said about them, and that <laughs> wasn't what they said about them. Uh, you, no, uh, you are case, assuming you are assuming that they said those things because that's a logical deconstruction of history, but it ends up being incorrect, like. So many of our maybe ideas. I was, about I was, maybe I was speaking of just I've one. Got to go, I've got to go. I've maybe got to I was speaking of one place. I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> uh, hey, uh, Joanne, great to be with you. You're a very brilliant woman. It's very stimulating. Thank you. Really excellent. Thank you. Uh, forgive Dr. Butler. He's retired, you know, and is just not as acute as he was. <laughs> did you say he's cute a great or musician? Or hey, did you say cute or acute? <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, Llewellyn. I love, uh, you. I love you too. We'll, we'll, we'll All right. come back on, Joanne. We can talk about much. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Johnny, take us away. Okay. <laughs> well, I know it's kind of late. I hope I didn't wake you. But what I got to say can't wait. I know you understand. Every time I try to tell you, the words just came out wrong. So I have to say, I love you in a song. Woo! Nicely done. <laughs> okay, that was wonderful. I will give you a shout. I just sent you an email with my phone number. Great.